listening to The Higher Ed Marketer, a podcast geared towards marketing professionals in higher education. This show will tackle all sorts of questions related to student recruitment, donor relations, marketing trends, new technologies, and so much more. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast. I'm Troy Singer along with Bart Kaler. And this week, the conversation is marketing and utilizing athletics for stronger enrollment. And I know this is something that Bart feels strongly about. Today, we speak with Jim Carr, who's the president and CEO of the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, also known as NAIA. And Bart, I think he gives us a lot of tips and a lot of information that some colleges are probably not thinking on how to utilize athletics to grow their enrollment and also to hone in on mission fit students. Yeah, I think you're exactly right on that, Troy. And the thing I like about the conversation we have with, with Jim today is uh, NAIA is focused on kind of that small uh, college athletic group. So most of their members are, I think Jim says around 1800 students. And so, um, and I know that small schools rely a lot on recruitment of athletes for the overall, you know, class fit and, and to get in there. And so Jim kind of talks us a little bit about how NAIA is supporting their member schools uh, with data, with uh, with resources, and with ways of uh, of looking at athletics a little bit differently and, and helping the schools do that successfully. I think there's a lot of good tips and tricks uh, if you've already got an athletic program in your school on how you might be able to tweak some things to get uh, better marketing and better engagement between recruiters and, 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 and coaches. Um, but overall, I just really like Jim's approach to everything and the way that they kind of um, do things at NAIA. Here's our conversation with Jim Carr. We welcome Jim Carr to the conversation, who is the CEO and president of the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, otherwise known as NAIA to the Higher Ed Marketing Podcast. Jim, if you could, please introduce us to you and also the NAIA. Yeah, thanks, Troy. Uh, Jim Carr, president of the NAIA. I've been uh, in that position since 2006, so I've been around for a while. Uh, the NAI is a, a membership association made up of roughly 250 colleges and universities uh, across the country, primarily in the Midwest, Southeast, and, and out West. And our, our membership is made up of about 80% private institutions, and those institutions on average have about 1,800 to 2,000 students, uh, really count on athletics to be a big driver of enrollment and and just a big part of the campus. And so uh, we're, we're there to support them in all their efforts, and especially to run championships and make sure that student athletes on those campuses are eligible to, to compete. Thank you. And the reason why we asked you to be on the show is to get tips for our listeners on how athletics can be used to strengthen or increase enrollment. And that's a conversation that I believe you have on an ongoing basis with the presidents and leaders in the schools that are members of NAIA, is that correct? Yeah, we do, and um, it, it's a conversation that has um, grown with fre frequency and importance, I think, over the last decade or so. Uh, it used to be something that wasn't talked about nearly as much in terms of the, the impact that athletes can have on enrollment, but I think schools and leaders of those institutions in particular have um, just, just grown to understand and appreciate the importance of it, so yeah, we talk uh, at every leadership meeting about it in some regard. And we've even created a major initiative called Return on Athletics uh, that's, that brings in a lot of data and assists our schools to, to not only understand the, the potential opportunities and, and how things are working on their own campus, but then be able to compare that with uh, the 250 other institutions around the country and, and uh, make, some, make some decisions based on, the, on those data. That's good to know, Jim. I, I, I'm working with several organizations, you know, the different um, different groups that support, especially private education. And I think that shared data is so important. I think sometimes it feels like, boy, I'm not here by myself. What's it like? And, and you, you kind of think, oh, I'm competing against that other school down the down the road that we, you know, that we compete in athletics with. But a lot of times we're not really competing against one another as private schools. We're competing against the the other alternatives, the, the community colleges, the publics and things like that. And so 
the, the bigger publics, I should say. And so I think that um, I think that's interesting. I mean, what what are some of the things that you kind of tell the schools as far as enrollment and and I guess part of it is even retention. Talk through that a little bit, because I think athletics does provide a little bit of a unique solution for some of that. Yeah, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, and I guess I first should say that we're only in the second year of collecting data from all of our schools. We had a couple of years of a, a pilot program where we had eight institutions, then 40. But this is the we're completing the second year of a, a full data set. So we're still somewhat in its infancy, but the things that we've concentrated so far with some of our research briefs and some of the uh, information we're sending out are, uh, we've been really focusing on retention, uh, as, as you mentioned, and just trying to analyze things like what what size of a roster in various sports uh, is kind of the sweet spot for retention. And if, if you get too large, does that have, does retention right. go down and, and vice versa? If you're too small, uh, what's the impact there? And then in terms of enrollment, uh, things like the impact of financial aid or competitive success, how do those impact the ability to attract student athletes onto your campus? And so right now it's because um, two years does not make a trend in most people's eyes. We're, we're, uh, we're speculating a little bit and, and really showing, you know, here's our, here's our theory around those kinds of things. But as the, as we have more longitudinal data, I think it's going to get even stronger and stronger, but at a minimum uh, it allows leaders on campuses to take a step back and say, Oh, I wonder I hadn't really thought about the, uh, or maybe I thought about the appropriate roster size for us, but I didn't have any data to help support that decision. And so now they're starting to, to think about it in, in that way. And of course, on their own campus, they should have uh, data going back even farther to help them analyze it on their own, own campus. I like that approach because I think that it's so important. I mean, I think so many times historically, uh, colleges and universities have kind of seen athletics as, you know, that's that's over there. That's the that's the AD's responsibility. And and I'm noticing a lot more schools are partnering between the athletics department and the um, and the admissions and enrollment department to just start to um, and to to degree student life with retention, but to really um, just make sure that everyone's talking with one another. I know that you know a lot of times schools, especially smaller privates, rely a lot on the uh, you know you know thirty forty fifty percent on the recruitment of the coaches um, for to fill their classes. But talk a little bit about, you know, how how these, you know, how departments can be more um, facilitatory with each other, because I think that's a challenge that some schools face. Yeah, I think it's a great, great point, Bart. And for us, most of our data in that area is kind of anecdotal at this point. We're trying to gather various models and, and talk with people about what does what does work best and how do you how do you think about, um, as you said, essentially the cooperation between admissions, financial aid and the, and the athletic department or the or the VP of enrollment coming in to that equation. And I think the schools that are having the most success in athletics, and by that, I don't necessarily mean in competition, but the, right. the most success in terms of attracting students, do it in a way that's consistent with the discount rate they're trying to keep and, um, and retaining those students at a high percentage. Those, <clears throat> those schools tend to have great integration between the admissions and the enrollment side of the house and, and athletics. And it can be structured in many different ways. Some even put their athletics department, most of the coaches embed them in the enrollment area where others uh, just have cross-functional uh, integration in, in some way. So there are a lot of, a lot of ways to do it, but the, the schools who are, are not very effective at, at uh, that cross-communication and that integration are, are finding themselves struggling more so than the, the other schools. Okay, good. And I've got a few more questions about the business of student athletics. Before I get that, before we kind of move away from this data point, is there a place that people can access this data or is that for members or how does that work? It is, it is right now for members, mm -hmm. members only. It's a member benefit. Um, we are in the process of creating what we're calling the uh, return on athletics calculator, which is kind of a, you know, if you think of a mortgage calculator, you can go into a website of a mortgage company and you know, put in your own data and find out what, you know, what it might look like if you were to take out a mortgage with that company. We're, we're creating a similar type tool mm -hmm. so that schools who are not members can come in and get a little sneak peek. And then if they are interested in getting more information, um, it's a it's a pretty laborious process to give us the exact same data that a member would give us, but we, we would ask for some um, a, a smaller data set and then be able to give them a, a little bit of a snapshot of what it'd like to be in the NEI and have access to return mm -hmm. on athletics. But that would be on a, we've done it in a, in a couple of occasions already and we're getting some NCAA Division II and Division Three schools interested in, in learning more, especially as we're getting 
the chance, like we are with, with you all today, to talk a little bit more about it and, and have people make people aware that it's a it's a possibility. That's great. I, I love that idea of that tool. So so we'll make sure that we've got a note of that for everyone. Um, I guess moving on, you just mentioned NCAA, you know, two and three divisions, and I know that um, the way that NAI a approaches things. You know, a lot of people are familiar with NCAA, and and that's kind of the de facto. But tell me a little bit about the the different approach that you take. You know, that that people might not qu- quite fully understand. Yeah, you know, our our strategy and our our vision for the NAI is to to be the experts in the business of small college athletics. Our our membership is made up of only small colleges, essentially. You know, we do have a few uh, that might be north of five, or even a couple north of ten thousand. Students, but as I mentioned earlier, our average enrollment is, is just under two thousand, and so um, the ways in which those kinds of schools use athletics is very different than you know, pick your big state school, University of Oklahoma or University right. of Tennessee. Uh, they're going to be able to drive revenue through, obviously, through sponsorships and their big television contracts and those kinds of things that just aren't available to small schools. So um, our belief is, and now I think the vast majority of our membership is in agreement that uh, they need to understand how to use athletics to drive enrollment and to, to, if they can keep their discounts in check, to be a, a net tuition uh, revenue driver and, and things like that. So our, um, well, we, want, we also focus on quality competition and making sure that our championships are run well and that only student athletes on the field and competition are ones that our membership agrees should be eligible. Um, kind of the st- what people think of as the standard uh, role of an athletics association. Those things are still really important, uh, but if our schools can't figure out a way to be um, be profitable in a sense and, and to right. keep, keep the doors open, then none of that really matters. Right. And then about, you know, how does that work with, uh, you know, like when we, when we all think about, you know, D1 schools, it's all scholarship based. How does that work with NAIA schools? Yeah. So when, uh, you know, as a comparison to NCA, like most people think of us as kind of a hybrid between NCA division two and division three. And, and by that, I mean that um, you know, our scholarship limits and the ability to give athletic aid, is very similar to NCAA Division II. Okay. Uh, but our schools look a little bit more like NCAA Division III schools in the sense that most NCAA schools, NCAA D3 schools are private and small um, for the most part. And so um, the schools that are with us, at least some of them, uh, like that model. They're, you know, they can uh, they compete against like-minded institutions, so they're not having to break the bank to compete. Right. Uh, but at the same time, there is some value in being able to give a student or you know, let their parents know they're getting an athletic scholarship. People can draw their own conclusions about what that says about society, that some value an athletic scholarship more than an right. academic scholarship. But I think that's just, that's just the way it is these days. And so yeah. schools are able to use that to their advantage in a strategic way. And it's, uh, it's really a nice fit or a niche for NAI. Good. Jim, when I think about collegiate athletics right now, image and likeness comes to the forefront and, I'm not sure if it's accurate, but when they first announced it, I thought that's going to give the bigger schools advantage over the smaller schools because the smaller schools might not be able to offer as much or offer some of the same things. Could you speak to how smaller schools are taking advantage of the image and likeness rules? Yeah, and Troy, I think your your, your assumption is correct in the sense that there are just more dollars available and you know the economics are different at the big schools compared to compared to smaller schools, but you know, what we're seeing in the NAI, we eliminated all of our restrictions around name, image, and likeness about three or four years ago, uh, kind of a year, year and a half before the NCA uh, got to that place. And, and we were kind of forced by the by a number of states who passed laws. Um, so we've been at it for, for quite a while now, and we have um, thousands of, of student athletes. We have a total of about 80,000 student athletes, and our um, our estimates are that two to 3,000 of those at least are in some way, shape, or form, taking advantage of, of name, image, and likeness. Now, for them, uh, it's typically the the higher dollar amounts would be, you know, maybe in five figures. There's a few students who might be earning more than ten thousand dollars or so, but that's mostly because they have a, a huge following on social media and mostly outside of their athletic ability or talent. You know, they're just right. they're just they're, they're they're influencer creating videos and other things and influencing, um, but they those things would have been against the rules five or six years ago, because the, the primary restriction that was, was lifted is uh, students weren't allowed to associate themselves as being a student athlete at a particular campus. And we all know on social media, that's almost impossible to, to remove that from your profile or whatever else you know, may be a part of. So that's really 
open the door for a lot of those things. And then, you know, also can give pitching lessons or you know, help coach kids in basketball and make some money. Again, things that weren't allowed uh, a number of years ago. And, you know, those are making a few hundred bucks here and there as opposed to thousands. But and, and then we do have the occasional, you know, Joe's Pizza Shop that will, you know, give all the offensive linemen free pizza just to just as a feel good thing and to help them out. And all those, you know, some of those things you hear at D1, but just at a smaller smaller level. So it's working well. We, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our great partnership with Open Doors. They were one of the first companies to come in and create a platform that not only helps student athletes improve their brand and understand how to promote themselves in terms of name, image, and likeness, but they also have a marketplace. So they're bringing companies in and and AI student athletes can uh, reach out to those companies just like a D1 uh, student athlete could. And so we have about at last count, a couple thousand kids in that on that platform. And we're just really starting to market it through our eligibility center and through other forms. So I think that'll grow uh, exponentially in the next few years. And is that something that your organization helps your membership colleges implement and do better? Do you give advice on how their athletes can go after some of those funds? We do, and it's primarily through that partnership with Open Doors. They're the they're the experts in it, and, and they're working with you know a lot of NCAA Division One schools. But with us, we created a partnership with them across all of our schools. Now it's not mandatory for a school to use them if they wanted to partner with someone else. They certainly could, but I think most of our schools are seeing the value of this collective um, marketplace and all the schools coming together to kind of work together to understand the, the different strategies for their students, and it also gives them. Uh, we don't have a huge compliance burden around this, but there are uh, students need to disclose when they're doing these kinds of things. And if they're in the open doors platform, it makes that almost seamless. When you sign one of these deals, it's just automatic that it, it goes into the system. So I, we do see, so we're, we're assisting through the, through the efforts of open doors, essentially. That's great. And, and I guess that kind of leads me to our next you know part of the conversation that we had talked about was the idea of you've kind of discussed a little bit about, you know, the difference of, of the student athletes in, in, in AIA versus maybe some other associations. Um, tell me a little bit about the demographics. I mean, obviously, there's small private schools and and there's, you know, uh, you know, because their average size is 1800. I've got some ideas, but maybe just help me under, understand a little bit more about the demographics of the member schools and, and how that affects, you know, the student athletes that they, that they recruit. Yeah. So, um, you know, in general are 250 members. And, um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is, is we have close to 80,000, uh, student athletes. So if, you know, if you just do the math, that's a little bit over 300 student athletes per school. And obviously some have more, some have less. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're, if you're a campus of a thousand to 1500 students, when you have three or 400 student athletes, that's a big presence of athletics on your campus. And so uh, I think schools are starting to understand uh, just the importance, importance of that. Uh, the other demographics that come to mind is while we certainly have schools in big cities like Chicago and Los Angeles, uh, you know, a lot of our membership tends to be in rural areas, which I think offer some advantages and some challenges uh, to, get, to get students there. So again, athletics can be a, a nice driver of that. And um, we also have a lot of pockets, especially in the Midwest, uh, where we have schools that are close to each other in geography, which creates natural rivalries and just schools that have been competing against each other for you know, almost 100 years and right. uh, fun things that can come about through that. And, and really, uh, not only from an enrollment and finance perspective, but just a nice experience for student athletes and students on campus when you know, a couple thousand people come out to a basketball game because they want to see uh, that competition against a rival. That's great. And I, I'm guessing that I mean, I work with a lot of small schools like the ones you've described, and I know a lot of our schools that we work with are, are NAIA schools. Um, and, I, and I often see sometimes that, um, you know, a lot of their, you know, these smaller schools, not only in athletics, but just the overall population, there's a lot of first-gen students. There's a lot of, um, a lot of Pell, Pell-eligible students. And so I'm sure that's kind of reflected in the athletics as well. Um, is that, is that what you find and, and do you provide any kind of, you know, member benefits or, or help that you can help schools to help, you know, how can you recruit these students that are, you know, might not quite understand, you know, the, the whole, they don't know how to navigate the college experience. Yeah. And I, I would say Bart, the answer is yes. In terms of first gen students, I mean, they're a big part of athletics and we're, but we're just starting to have, uh, because the tip of the iceberg is an analogy that comes to mind. We're, we're just starting to have some good data around that. And the first area is retention. We, we did a comparison of first-gen uh, student-athletes compared to 
uh, all other student athletes in, in the area of retention and the first gen students actually retained at a higher rate uh, than the non first gen. So we were pleased to know that. And now part of the equation is, you know, why is that? What are our schools doing well to retain them at a higher rate? Um, you know, we want to improve retention for all subsets or you know, people overall. But I, I, I was very encouraged to, to learn that um, right off the bat. And, and we, again, want to help schools to understand what's working and, and why that's happening. In terms of how to attract more first-gen students, we uh, that's certainly something that's on our, our list of, of areas we want to tackle, but we just haven't really gotten to that yet. Yeah, that's great. And I, I know a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, the Lumina Foundation for education on the podcast and they, I've done some work with them over the years and I know that they you know, have done some initiatives around first gen students. And one of the important things that they, they identified and discovered in some of their research that they support are, you know, these different cohorts that, that, um, you know, first gen students can get involved in and how being in a, being in a specific cohort sometimes can add, you know, stickiness and retention to those students because, you know, come end of semester, they're not, they're not, if they're already in a group or a cohort, they're not one to just kind of bail um, because they're just not making the fit. And uh, I, it seems to me like student athletics really kind of often serves that natural cohort. Is that kind of what you think too? Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a great point and um, you know, something we can certainly explore and hope our data will support that. But it, it does um, intuitively, that seems like a, uh, a, a conclusion that I would, I would agree with in the sense that, you know, Everyone wants to belong somewhere, right. and if you're a first-gen student, it's it's not something that's uh, been talked about in your family as you were growing up, and you just, it's all brand new to you as you get to the campus to have a have a built-in family or a built-in cohort. Uh, certainly, certainly helps, and we know that for the most part, our coaches um, that's part of the reason they're in their jobs. They want to win and they want to compete, but they're they're there to help young people grow and uh, you know, go on to be successful in life. And so I I know that. A number of our coaches pay, pay special attention to those who don't, whose families don't have any college experience. Right. So I think that fits, fits well with the, with what you're talking about. And it probably fits well with the smaller schools too. That's just part of the ethos sometimes of those right. smaller schools as well. Right. Well, we've talked a little bit about student athletes and sometimes I think we have in our mind a you know particular type of image, whether it be a female athlete or a, a male athlete. But sometimes I, I've noticed a lot of associations are, are identifying some new student athletes that many of us might not recognize as student athletes. And I'm, I'm specifically talking about esports. And so tell us a little bit about esports and, and how NAIA is starting to kind of look at that, because I know that's another very, very popular way that's, that schools are starting to look at other opportunities for recruitment. Yeah, I love to talk about our esports efforts and uh audience can bear with me. I'll go through a little bit of the history of it. And back in uh, 2016, I guess six years ago, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but um, we knew of six institutions that were uh, jumping in to start esports as a varsity sport, to use a traditional uh, word in, in sports. So meaning they were starting to recruit students onto campus as opposed to just students who are already there, allowing them to play uh, various esports. So we, we brought in these six institutions and said, well, why don't we start a an association to support esports. Now, starting a national association with six members is, is, is a leap of faith to you know, hoping that others will join. But the you know the, the there was pretty good evidence that it was going to grow pretty quickly. And so, five of those happened to be NAI schools. One was an NCAA Division II school, uh, but they all agreed to join. And so we we just kind of started going down the path. I'm not sure exactly where it was going to lead us, but fast forward to today, uh, we have about 200 member institutions. Uh, more than half of those are in the NCA for their traditional sports. Some, you know, Division One, like the University of Missouri, a lot of D2s and D3s, and then the you know, about 80 or so NEI schools. So it's a nice mix and nice blend. And right now, size of institution doesn't doesn't really predict success. You know, it just depends on you know, what resources even smaller schools want to want to put into it. But it's been it's been great for the vast majority of those institutions. And um, the way I like to think of it is that uh, for those naysayers out there, because I was a little skeptical when we first started doing it too, about, you know, the stereotypes of, of esports players being in the basement, you know, eating Doritos and drinking Mountain Dew. But um, what, what we found is that it's just the opposite when you bring it in as part of the campus uh, ethos. And we were talking a little bit uh, a few minutes ago about uh, first-gen students and wanting to have a sense of belonging and have a, a cohort that they can, can use to keep them on campus. And I think it's a similar concept with esports. Now these students 
um, are literally going from playing esports in the basement or in an apartment somewhere to doing so in many cases right in the middle of the campus. And they're, they're being seen differently by their fellow students and they feel differently because they now feel like this is something that's legitimized. And, um, you know, a lot of schools too are putting in physical fitness as a part of this and getting them, you know, giving them some assistance that traditional athletes typically get around academics and other things. So it's Mm -hmm. by and large been, been just terrific. You know, you still have the concerns about, um, is it really healthy to play these games for 12 hours a day or whatever some of the students are, are doing. But my view is most of them are going to be doing that on their own anyway. So, it's better to have a support system to help around it. So long-winded answer to say, um, it's just, it's fun to watch the, we actually started a separate association so we could attract schools that were not playing their traditional sports in the NAI. And so uh, it's called NACE, the National Association of Collegiate Esports. And uh, it's just going great guns and still a very, um, a business that's still maturing and has, mm-hmm. has a lot of growth and a lot of work to do, but by and large, great, great success. Now, are some of the schools that are members of, of NACE, are they offering scholarships or, or is it is it kind of similar to the NAIA where some are, some are not? It's part of the financial aid package, depending. Yeah, I would say it's um, it's very similar to smaller institutions on the athletic side. They're, yeah. uh, most most schools are trying to package some eSports scholarship as part of their financial aid offerings out to, out to students. And there are a handful who are giving out what's close to a full scholarship, but that's, that's pretty rare. So it's, right. um, you know, stacking on top of academic aid and other aid, uh, with the, maybe a $2,500 esports scholarship or mm-hmm. you know, something given more than that, but it's, it's, it's definitely a partial scholarship model. I think that's a uh, very interesting and, and I applaud you for stepping into that. And I, I think that it can be a little bit of uh, controversial or, or, you know, not sure about it, but, but again, it's a, it's a reality of our culture. It's a reality of life. It's a reality of Gen Z and, and alpha right. coming down the pike and, uh, and really being able to lean into that and, and, uh, make that a part of our, our campus culture, I think is, is, uh, is, is something that we should applaud. And, um, I'm glad to see you guys taking some leadership in that at the, at the association level. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's, it's exciting. And, um, you know, I, I sit on that board and I'm by far, uh, I know the least about esports of anyone else on the board. So I'm glad that, <laughs> The rest of them are there, but I hopefully I can add a little something from running an association. And just it's it's just a lot of fun to watch and to be a part of. That's great, Jim. At the top of the podcast, you mentioned admissions working well with athletics and some of the success that you have noticed. And I also know Bart has examples that he's mentioned in previous podcasts. Wanted to bring that conversation back and to encourage both of you to offer either examples or advice that you would give smaller schools on how they could strengthen that relationship to increase enrollment and also help in marketing. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one institution that comes to mind and I, you know, I can't tell you a ton about the exact structure on campus, but Morningside college is a great example to me. They, uh, came over to the NAI a little over 20 years ago from NCAA division two and, and their division two model, they had, uh, about 800 students total and about half of those were athletes and many of those were getting full scholarships. So with the way the president, John Reinders, who's about to retire, um, explained it to me is, you know, the, the 400 non athletes were, were, uh, having to support the school and, and kind of carry the 400 athletes who were getting, uh, in a lot of cases, full scholarships. And so they came over to the NAI and built a model where now they have about 2,500 students and still have a lot of student athletes, but as a percentage, it's much lower. So like they have five or 600 student athletes. But he talked a lot about the importance of um, partnership between admissions and enrollment and, and the athletic department. And the, you know, the, the coaches understand it on the front side that they're going to try to help them win. And they have, you know, they just won our football championship and they've won um, at a lot of levels and a lot of sports. But um, for, for Dr. Reinders and for the, the leadership on campus, the important thing was, you know, how do we keep uh, how do we move forward with athletics in a way that supports the institution? And so the coaches also understand that, you know, it's just not an open checkbook that they have to, to do it in a responsible way and that they're going to give a good bit of aid to one student. They need to attract some students that don't need as much aid to come to come to campus. So that's one specific example of how it worked. And then um, I know there are other institutions, as I mentioned before, that um, actually put coaches into the, into the admissions office. And I think it's an, it's an interesting model. I'm sure it has some challenges and I, I don't uh, have as much uh, 
interaction with admissions folks or enrollment people, but I know there would be probably some who might think that's a bad idea. So I know you have to have to figure out how to do it on campus with politics and other things. But I think, um, I think as Bart said earlier, coaches, there's, it'd be hard to argue that coaches are, are not the best recruiters on campus and know how to bring kids in. And so it seems, it would seem to be uh, a shame if you didn't try to utilize that ability and that talent and that expertise and in some way to attract students in general and you know, even use some of those uh, tactics and strategies to attract non-athletes. Yeah. And I, and I think too, Jim, I'll add to that, that I believe that sometimes this campuses that I see that are the most successful in integrating athletics and, and enrollment together are those that um, align uh, all the way from, from the top down on, on mission fit. Um, because I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's so critical, especially at some of these smaller privates that, that are uh, very mission oriented. I mean, every school is mission oriented. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, academic is the mission. Sometimes it's, you know, faith is the mission. There's different ways that you can define mission. But I think that having alignment throughout all of the faculty, staff, including coaches and recruiters on what are the best students that are actually going to, you know, flourish at our institution. And um, sometimes that's, that's, uh, you know, there are, there are some tough decisions to make in that, but I think at the same time, at the end of the day, a, a coach that can retain a student from freshman to senior on a, on a squad or on a, on a roster is really going to see more success on the, on the quarter, on the field, in whatever they're doing. Um, and, and that's why I think it's so critical that, you know, mission fit students are the ones that get recruited. And I think that just uh, adds adds value for everybody. I mean, you know, the last thing a student wants to do is end up at a, at a school that wasn't a good fit for them. Um, and, and nobody wants that. And so I think that a lot of times that success works well that way too. Right. I, I agree hundred percent. And you know, fit is important. As you mentioned there, every school has a mission, but they're very different depending on the institution and where you are. And one thing you said you know, triggered for me, one of the things we're trying to do with return on athletics is, is help people understand that, um, driving enrollment through athletics and do it in a financially responsible way doesn't mean that, that you can't be competitive, that it, right. you know, that you can do both. And we're, we're finding a lot of institutions that are um, having the most success in competition are also uh, finding success in, in driving enrollment and, and on the financial side. And we're, we're trying to help them understand the what's the, what's the cause and effect there and what's the, what's the connection. And, you know, Cause we also have schools that are spending a lot of money on athletics and not having success. And I, I would, you know, an obvious thing to point out is everybody can't win. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose in each competition. But, um, but I think, you know, most of our institutions can be competitive and do it in a way that uh, helps, helps the financial impact on campus. Great. Jim, as we bring the, this episode to a close, we'd like to ask you if you have either an impactful final thought or a quick tip that you can offer as it relates to strengthening enrollment and admissions through athletics that you would like to leave before we close our podcast. Yeah, Troy, I don't know if it's anything new from what we've already talked about, but I, I, it just seems to me for institutions that look like NEI schools, and by that I mean you know, schools that are around 2,000 students and um, primarily private institutions, um, this, this topic that we've essentially been talking about for the full podcast around how does athletics have a positive impact on the campus broadly, uh, if, if schools aren't paying attention to that and they're in that category, it just seems, it, I, I can't understand why, and I think they're putting themselves in, maybe not in danger of, uh, of extinction, but, it, but certainly um, are not exploring all the ways that they can be viable and, and sustainable over, over time. And so... Um, I know there are some presidents that still aren't on that on that train yet, so to speak. But uh, you know, as I go to CIC, Presidents Institute, and other places, it's it's certainly obvious that more and more are thinking about it. And so, if if there are any presidents out there or people in leadership positions on campus, and they want to understand how we're looking at that data and the things that we're we're trying to do to help our our institutions, we'd love to talk with them. Whether they're they're in a position to potentially join the NAI or not, uh, you know, I, I, have, I think we have some sense of responsibility to. To, to just make sure people understand that better. And uh, we have, a, I guess, a greater responsibility to our own members in terms of uh, sharing the data and things like that. But it's a, it's an area that I'm passionate about and I think it's critically important. And so the last thing I would say on that is whatever your model is, that the, the, the cross-section, the integration, the communication between athletics and, and enrollment just continues to be more and more important. 
Thank you, Jim. And for those presidents or anyone else that would like to get more information about NAIA uh, or to contact you with further questions that they have after hearing the podcast, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, through our website, NAI.org uh, is the best. And my contact information is on there, but it's just jcarr, J-C-A-R-R at NAI.org. And i uh, love to hear from anybody out there who has more questions and uh, certainly could set up a call or a Zoom meeting if, uh, if that's of interest. Well, thank you for being a guest on the podcast and helping us get this message out. I hope that it does spur more questions and inquiries that you can follow up on. Uh, Bart, do you have any final thoughts before we close the show? Yeah, just a couple of things that I'm thinking is that I really like this idea of the business of student athletics. I think that, um, you know, so many times I think that we forget in leadership uh, that, especially as we talk about marketing, that there's an opportunity to look at different segments of types of students and how we market to them and how we recruit them. And there's, uh, you know, athletics in high school and club and everything else is such a big part of our culture. Um, and, and a lot of those students will end up, you know, hoping to, you know, eventually play their, continue their sport into, uh, into college. And so I think that the opportunity that schools have for that level of, of marketing to those students and using that for recruitment is a great thing. And I, I think a lot of the things that we talked about in here is the importance of making sure that there's, you know, alignment between the, the athletic department and the, and the recruitment department. And I would also say alignment within the marketing as well, because the, the coaches are going to need support from marketers in the best ways to communicate. I mean, there's a set of rules around, you know, re the recruitment of college students and, and athletes. And so understanding that and working with the athletic department, but being able to provide them, you know, is it is it a separate type of uh, acceptance package? I mean, you know, if you've got half of your students that you're on your campus are going to be student athletes, you know, maybe there's a special, you know, way that you also tie in the, the acceptance package. You know, if you're sending a a big, you know, folder or, or big, uh, you know, presentation, maybe you kind of do a nod and personalize it. So it's toward, you know, their, their sport that they're a part of, or their esports that they're a part of. And I really like the idea of the esports too. And, and I, and I applaud that because I think that's one of those things that is taking a leap of faith. It's going out a little bit further and doing something creative. And I would also challenge, you know, the schools that are looking at esports, how can you use that marketing in that as well? I mean, you know, you think about, there's platforms within the esports where you know you can buy ads even within the games themselves and so what a great place if you have an esport uh, program at your school to actually be placing digital ads within these games so that the students as they're you know zipping around the uh, racetrack at 600 miles an hour they see the ad up for your school go by so there's a lot of ways that we need to be creative when we start thinking about the recruitment of of certain segments and this is a good conversation about how to do that for athletes Thank you, Bart. And again, thank you to Jim Carr for helping us get this information out. And we encourage our listeners to contact him and the organization for further conversation. The Higher Ed Marketer podcast is sponsored by Kayla Solutions, an education marketing and branding agency, and by Think Patented, a marketing execution company combining print, technology, and personalization for deeper engagement with your target audience. On behalf of Bart Kaler, I'm Troy Singer. Thank you for your listen. You've been listening to The Higher Ed Marketer. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to leave a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.